time to glaze ReZero. Thank God Otaku Spirit released a video that's under 40 minutes so that I can actually react to it. Let's see what he has to say about ReZero. For as long as ReZero anime has been out, I've never understood the one big criticism it has. What? Subaru Natsuki. Some people mm. absolutely hate Subaru. I mean... I get it. Why wouldn't I hate him? He's fucking annoying. All he does is cry, complain, lash out, and get mad. And it makes sense. The whole point of this character is to show you what the average neat that did nothing with their life, you know, before coming here, would then face, right? Do you expect this person to be Jesus Christ in the beginning and save everything? No, it's the buildup of this flawed character as you have the most realistic depictions of an average person struggling with the impossible challenges that we keep going, suffering, suffering, mentally broken down, and of course, he's gonna break down. He's gonna start complaining, crying, and shouting, and yelling. And a lot of people just see that part and get pissed off because it's kind of like hard to take, right? Me, I can just sit back, shit on him when he's being stupid, but understand that this is necessary. This is going to be a lesson for him to grow later on. And a lot of people, though, they don't care for that kind of storytelling. They just want someone that's perfect from the beginning to just do everything perfectly. In every time I post a clip of ReZero on X, I at least get one guy saying, but Subaru's annoying, which you would think. Most likely, that profile picture of that commenter most likely has a Mushoku Tensei profile picture, yep. Both fandoms live rent-free in each other's heads, waging war when the authors, the creators of the show are friends. So cringe. I think means that they would love ReZero because, I mean, come on, its main mechanic for the series requires Subaru to die. Yep. Gutted, smashed, splat, cursed to death, chomp, head smashed like a grape, hung, sli- Some people probably does enjoy the show when he dies. But the death, I, I don't know. They, it's, it's something about the way he acts. And like, I'm not gonna lie, like Subaru pisses me off a lot. Like even in season three, that beginning episode of how we, you know, talked to Kiritaka with Liliana, that shit was so fucking stupid, but I get it, right? He acts on impulse and we need to have, you know, some sort of drama happen for the story to kind of move forward. But uh, I don't think most people really watch this shit for him dying. They just get upset when Subaru starts complaining. And when you think about it, when you really think about what's going on with him, it makes a lot of sense. Sliced, so on and so on. Even still, I sort of understand this criticism. I mean, Subaru is kind of a dumb kid at first, mm -hmm. you know, because he's a dumb kid. Like, mm -hmm. you know, kids do. He's eccentric, he's annoying, poses like he's a massive Saturday Night Fever fan. And there's even lore in why he does this pose. Like season two, the trials explains it, right? This is an absolute loser. He did nothing with his life, showed up here, thinks he's the fucking main character, which he is, but then he treats other people like NPCs, like it's a video game. And once he realizes that shit gets real here, then he starts to kind of fold and he starts to have, you know, these crazy crash outs that a lot of people just can't stomach. Even still, all of season one and even into season two, I was a big super apologist. The guy is just dealing with a shitty situation the best that he can. And mm -hmm. even when he's at his most unbearable and most snotty, I sort of find myself understanding due to sheer paranoia his situation creates. I mean, how would you feel if people around- Here's the thing though. People, the average person is so stupid, they cannot empathize nor even try to think from the other person's perspective. They never reason in their heads why he's like this. All they see is someone crying and complaining and they get upset without even thinking. Why are they complaining? Why are they upset? Around you kept forgetting the painful sacrifices that you do. Now, as season three has met its mid-season finale, I can't help but find myself reminded once again what an absolute incredible series ReZero is. To be honest, with as much as we are over flooded with Isekai series, season after season, very few floating to the top, let alone rocketing up to orbit, it's enough mm. that makes you want to disconnect it from its own category. Similar to other properties like Mushoku Ten. Yeah, I mean, compared to the vast amount of Isekai slop that we eat up in this channel, ReZero and Mushoku Tensei, these shows definitely are on a different caliber of its own. In fact, this is how every isekai should be in terms of how like deep the lore is, how great the world building is. Each character feels like there's a purpose and a reason. It's just not some random character that we see once in a while just for fan service and has no meaning to the overall plot. It's definitely like a different tier of isekais.
Tensei. That's because ReZero isn't just another isekai. It isn't just another fantasy series. It's ReZero, damn it. It's a damn good story. Back when season one aired in 2016, admittedly, the initial hook of the series was the shock value. Our Subaru finds himself transported to another world, is overcome with joy and dreams of becoming an OPMC. His inner Chuni self tries to blast villains. He desperately awaits his heroine rescue scene, all before getting himself wrapped up in a situation where he wants to help this pretty girl with her troubles and dies uncomfortably gruesome deaths. Mm -hmm. Over and over again. Every time he dies, he resets to a certain point in time, and only he remembers what happened in the previous loop. Everything that he's achieved, undone. Everyone that he's met, now a stranger. Now that's fine and all, but we're not getting to the hook yet. At least for me. Shock value is one thing, but the reset mechanic isn't quite there yet. We'll follow the hook? What was the hook? First episode alone, I think the shock value of the regression was pretty much the hook. It's like, oh shit, he died, now what? Oh, he respawns, there's a checkpoint. I don't think there really was another point after that. That was such a big shock that I was like really like, oh, now I'm going to watch it. Well, if we're going to bring that aspect up of like such an impactful moment in the beginning of the episodes, beginning of the series, where it really got you going. Episode 3 for me, personally because of the Elsa versus Reinhardt fight. The fact that there's so much like hype surrounding these characters, the insane display of powers, that alone got my Oonga Boonga monkey self enjoying ReZero a lot more. All this is a series of gruesome resets where Subaru is driven to not make the same mistakes again and ultimately get to the good end. Now why would he do such a thing as a massive question mark? I mean, one gruesome death is enough for me. Because <laughs> he simps and he has a savior complex. He wants to save Amelia. For her though? No. For himself to prove his worthlessness because of all the baggage that he's carried coming into this. See, Subaru has fallen head over heels for a girl named Amelia, a half-elf with beautiful silver hair. The problem is he couldn't have picked a worse candidate for his heart. That's because Amelia is a candidate for the royal selection, a process to find the next ruler of the kingdom. And with her having a similar appearance to a certain evil witch of the past, many people don't like her or want her to be selected. Thus, many groups are working in the shadow in order to take her out. God, I fucking hate every one of you retards in chat right now. Holy shit. Like, god damn, bro. You have no respect at all for the content. You literally having mid-fucking conversation about fucking fake, strange, fake, nothing about the topic of the video. Holy shit, I should just put this shit in fucking sub mode only. Holy fuck, you guys are fucking cringe. Gen genuinely, none of you deserve this content. Fuck you. Out. Over all these death, slow progression, and eventually meeting Amelia's sponsor, Rosewall, and his maids, we finally get to the point that had me literally hooked on ReZero. The maids? Yes. Rem. We got a Rem simp. I mean, Rem is so good, though. By the end, right? After Arc 2 and after Arc 3, you see what Rem is. But, like, in the beginning? Like, seeing Rem and Rem as a design, I was like, okay, what are, what are these lolly-like maids? Uh, okay. Rem, Rem, Rem. I'm kidding, but I really do love Rem. By the way, you're banned in my chat if you say who is Rem. No, the reason why I got hooked... Based. The amount of fucking people that just keep spamming who's Rem like 8, 12 years after the meme's already dead. It's just so cringe. You are actual NPCs programmed to emote, programmed to say a certain thing when you see something because you have no individuality. Hooked on ReZero during the whole Rosewall Manor thing was because it started to present a deeper element of Subaru's progression or rather regression for the sake of the story. Paranoia and frustration, the curse of the return by death. See, as Subaru is navigating to try to figure out why he's dying, he is constantly growing bonds with those around him while simultaneously becoming paranoid with those same people. Who is killing him? Who is the threat? And yes, why does someone that he's been so close to in one loop want to kill him in the next? More specific- And that's the beauty of ReZero. The fact that we were so convinced the fact that we were so convinced that we had earned the trust of everybody, that we had gained their favor, and that we're trying to save them, without even realizing that every one of his actions causes more suspicion onto himself. In episode 7, when you realize that like they didn't ever give a fuck about him, 
that was the moment of such catharsis where I just broke down. I was like, damn, all those moments, all those slice of life moments you fucking built up, gone, slapped in the face. None of that shit mattered and we die. And it's just, that's when I realized that like this show, this really isn't a game. Everyone else has their own different agendas. Things are moving. Things are not static. Like Roswell is scheming the entire time. Ram and Rem as well. And Subaru thought that he was just being a cool person. Trying to be funny. Be the class clown. And gain the favor of everyone else. Turns out that only made him more of a target. Thank you, Cryo, for the tier one sub. Specifically, the point in which he leaves the manor and Rem hunts him down. Subaru's frustrating cries as he's brutally killed hit me in a way that made me realize this series is going to be something special. Yes. Episode 3 was like a good hook for like a hype moment. Episode 7 was, oh, I see kind of moment. It's hard to describe it in feelings. It's just, I don't think I've broken down crying like that watching anime before. There's been no other moments where it was that bad for me. There's some moments here and there, even down that on episode 7, like, yeah. Yeah, I was crying, but... It wasn't like episode 7 or ReZero. It's something about this whole self-respect and just self-desire and everything that Subaru worked towards and then just getting slapped in the face as nobody actually gave a fuck. That's such a relatable experience for anybody, I think. To have worked so hard for it not to matter and, in fact, only cause even more suspicion and people to hate you. It's like that moment was when I realized that ReZero is like super deep unironically i think it's a very deep show is that you know portrays the inner psyches and the psychology of a person who is a loser who has so many flaws coming into this fantasy world and then to be dealt with these hellish you know challenges for him to grow is like okay this this is definitely like a cut off the rest compared to any other isekai that i've seen other than certain few like mushoku tensei the writing is on a different level. It captures both the frustration of what the return by death causes Subaru, while also simultaneously reminds us that the people around him see his actions differently. It was a perfect encapsulation of the cause and effect of what Subaru is able to do. Not to take his power for granted, but also be mindful that things aren't pretty in this cutthroat world. Additionally, on top of that, another great thing this looping presented was a creative way for the viewer to get to know the characters Why of the Roswell? world. Rather than slow down the pacing and drag out scenes with massive exposition dumps, we not only get to explore the characters through different paths Subaru takes, keeping it consistently fresh, but additionally, and this is the most important, we see characters in different light. And yeah. A lot of people complain about the regression of it just being filler. Like, I cannot comprehend being so stupid that you think that looping, you know, the same days, even though you're clearly doing different things and having different interaction with characters, and again, seeing them in a different light, how could you possibly think that this is filler? That it's just like repeated lazy content? You get to see these characters in a deeper depth than you've ever seen before, right? Some path, you're really doing it well with Ram or Ram. Some path, they fucking hate you. And this, and, and, and it kind of feels like a. Whenever you play like a visual novel game or some sort of different game where there's like these paths, right? Sometimes you can try to be a completionist to try to figure out every path you can, but sometimes you go on a different path and it's only that, you know, that run, that specific like run of the game, right? ReZero and its ability to regress and get to see other characters in different lights and other events, I think kind of makes it feel like more like a completionist route. In one loop, Subaru can be super nice to Rem, and we get to see the lighter side of her, while in another loop, he avoids her. And in the end, we get to see her dangerous side that seeks to protect the manor. In one loop, Rem becomes cursed, and we see Rem go into a murderous rage, thus highlighting her willingness to destroy everyone in the manor for the sake of her sister. This is a great thing, because the characters of ReZero are some of my favorites in anime. Each That's right. Every character is so deep. They're not static. Just characters that have one purpose and you never see them again, right? Well, some of them you might very un very unimportant characters But the way that the anime is able to show you different sides of these characters that you would have never imagined Utilizing the regression I think is genius Each and every one of them have a great design interesting personalities driving force strengths weaknesses 
and most importantly, depth. It's rare to have a series where I just want a deep dive into every single one of them, which yes. is honestly a really incredible feat because... Yes, like, I think a character is so great when, again, it's like an onion layer. The more you get to learn about them, the more you peel back the onion layer, the more enriched their lore becomes. It even adds to the world building and just gets to enjoy the show over easier. When you have such depth of world building and characterization, it makes you feel way more immersed in the show. Everything feels like it's important. Like Priscilla, for example, right? You see this girl and she's just so pompous and arrogant and cocky. You have no clue what she's really about. But later on, you get to realize that she's known as like the sun princess. Some sort of like exiled princess, right? There might have been some shit that happened in like a neighboring continent, which is I think Wallachia. I don't know the exact lore because I don't want to be spoiled. But things like this kind of like highlights, oh, she's not just this random girl that showed up. She's gone through a bunch of bullshit. She's here for a reason. And the more you get to learn about her character, you realize that while she may be like an arrogant, pompous asshole, suddenly when you start to like match her pride and arrogance, she starts to respect you a little bit more, at least find you entertaining, right? Many of these characters just have so much like lore and depth into them, again, that makes it so immersive. That, that is when you are really into a show. Rather than being a show that you just forget about, sometimes like when I was doing ReZero Marathon, all I could really think about was these characters and where they're from and what they're about. Because, like, the lore, the depth, I got hooked. I'm so immersed. I'm so engaged. The cast at this point is huge. Ram's devotion to Subaru, yet her tragic past with her sister, Ram. Ram's history with her sister and her devotion to Rosewall. Rosewall's longtime devotion to Echidona. And his history with her and Beatrice. Beatrice's longtime solitude and her final message from Echidona. I want Priscilla to step on me. The backstory of okay. Pelagus and Fortuna. Otto's constant meddling in the background. Wilhelm's history with his family. I ship Mimi and Garf. Felt's me rise too. from Street Rat to the leader of the Outcasts. Reinhardt's too damn OP and hot. Garf struggle with his family, and so on, and so on, and so on. Shoot, even the villains of the series have me super intrigued. Which reminds me, mm. both Tape and White Fox absolutely nail villains. Every time one shows up, there's this strong sense of dread that just comes with them. I would say it's thanks to Better the Goose and how he was portrayed immediately. That was our first impression on what an archbishop is that represents a sin. A sin archbishop that represents Slaz, Betrigus Romani Conti, this. That episode, when he dropped in, the performance, the craziness displayed by his actions, his voice acting, it's insane. He's like a mad poet. And you're just shocked, stunned, because like, oh shit, now we get to see witch call stuff and they're like this? Kind of like sets an expectation, like a, like a standard of what the... Like the endgame villains of this show could be. I'm not saying the Archbishops are endgame villains, but so far, right, there hasn't been anything of that caliber in season one by like, what was it? Like episode 15? Right? Yeah, episode 15 is the one where Petrigus did the theme, you know, Rem Twister, you know, and then Puck's asleep along with my daughter, and then the credits roll. It's just fucking crazy. That kind of first impression, I think, really just like consolidates such a threat such an importance that when you meet these archbishops they're not to be fucked around with and then immediately what happens season two happens and you get two archbishops immediately and the devastation that they cause again just hypes up the villains in this show so much and each of these archbishops they're so deep right at a first glance you're gonna think that betrigus is just crazy and he's just talking nonsense but the more you analyze what he's saying the more you try to understand where he's coming from, you start to re really recognize, like, what does these sins mean to them and how do they behave? The funny thing about Betrigus is how diligent he is. It's a virtue. Diligence is a virtue that opposes sloth, which he represents as the sin, right? And he punishes those that are slothful by just doing crazy shit. And he rewards that are diligent. And you would wonder, why the fuck does an archbishop act this way? It's like the complete opposite of leaning into a sin. Then you get to see a little bit more of, I guess, like season two content, right? With the trials and the backstory of Betrigus and Fortuna and stuff and how he came to be. I'm not sure if it's ever been explicitly stated, but to me, it felt like Betrigus was really never meant for, you know, taking sloth, as he said. And he's not even compatible with that shit, right? He constantly bleeds out his eyes. He's just in so much pain whenever he uses his powers. But the diligence and the sin, I, I think it's just... Such like deep writing that every character has a specific theme that they're 
hardcore about and how this represents them. It's just peak writing. To be truthful, the weight of their rival is often facilitated by Subaru's lack of power, but additionally testament to the closeness that we have to the characters. We don't want to see them suffer. We don't want to see them harmed. And unfortunately, with a reset aspect, they will get harmed because a reset can happen. <laughs> Even still, being presented with powerful allies like Reinhardt never alleviates the fear of dread that the series creates. Petalgeus's creepy person. Yes, and that's the thing that I fucking hate about this show, which also is, I think, a good thing. That you have these insane allies like Reinhardt, Yet, he pops off once in episode 3 of season 1, then fucks off until season 3. There's these very creative ways that Tape introduces OP things and then immediately benches them or nerfs them, right? For example, Reinhardt has night duties that he has to attend to. He can't be everywhere at once. Roswell, the greatest you know, magician of this kingdom, is actually against us the entire time. Well, you could say that he's acting against us, but at the end of the day, he viewed Subaru as like, you know, the ultimate tool, right? Uh, what else do you have? At the end of Season 2, Biku and Subaru has this crazy moment of using al Minya and Al-Shamak to get rid of the Great Bunnies, right? But what happens? Turns out, we can't use that all the time. That was a once-in-a-lifetime thing that happened because Biku stockpiled mana for 400 fucking years, and now it's gone. Now, Subaru and Biku, they can do very little compared to what we saw in Season 2, right? See how every time something OP happens where it's just like finally we have a trump card well guess what it gets nerfed it gets benched in a very creative way that makes sense to the story reader because if you had like a solve all button right here's the problem with op characters yeah once in a while having them pop off is fun but if they're always solving your problems it's lazy it's boring it's not fun Personality as he effortlessly turns the powerful Rem into a pretzel. Capella's twisted nature to turn everything into grotesque things. Regulus blasting Subaru's leg off with a pebble. Pandora erasing that very same Regulus from even existing. Shoot, even to this day, the existence of Elza and Garf's mind fills me with foreboding that I still can't shake off. So there's antagonist characters that I'm honestly excited to see what they do with. While at first characters like Henkel can be dirtbags, I just assume at some point Tape will end up explaining them in a way that makes them at least understandable. Even yeah, I mean, they said that if Subaru wasn't the main character of the show, Tape said that Heinkel would be. Isn't that fucking crazy? That this piece of shit alcoholic drunk that ruins everything, you know, is actually a very deep character. And there must be a reason why he's like this. And when you understand why he's like this, then maybe you could empathize and realize that, ah, oh, this is why he's so shitty, right? We haven't got that explanation just yet. I'm not sure when we're ever going to get that. Even if they remain dirtbags. Overall, though, the characters are great. It's similar to my love to something like Bungo Stray Dogs, where no matter what character the scene focuses on, I'm intrigued to know what they think about the current situation or what they plan on doing. Like right now, Al, Al. and Oto are on my sus list. They yes. know too damn much. <laughs> Auto is Pandora. Here's the thing. While I love the reset mechanic of ReZero and its effects on Subaru and those around him, it's not as if I want this concept to become repetitive. Thankfully, ReZero doesn't do this. It yeah, thanks to straight bet, right? What happened in season two after Subaru had therapies from all the witches and Satala says like, why can't you realize that this power is meant to save you as well and to value yourself and not, you know, sacrifice everything for the sake of one we strictly you know went against roswell's ideologies and now he's trying to really just save everything and everyone and now we also have a promise with roswell right roswell said that okay you're gonna try to make your own cake and eat it too well if you can't save everyone around you and move on i will force a fucking reset right that's what he said and roswell's obviously not here with us right now but subaru right now continuously gets fucked up leg gone, cursed, all these shitty things are happening, and we haven't gotten a reset in such a long time in Season 3. And I think that uh, it's, a, it's a, again, a brilliant way of writing to nerf this aspect of throwing away a run when it's half optimal, right? You're not treating this like a speed run of a game when you're just constantly trying to do frame-perfect runs and, you know, get your best, you know, best run possible. But if you fuck up a little, you can just reset the run. Subaru is not going to do that, nor can he do that anymore. The whole straight bet theme of valuing each run and going to the bitter fucking end, this now creates a scenario where we can't just abuse that power. And if some people find this annoying, they're like, come on, bro. So many shitty things are happening. Just, you know, cut yourself. 
it's not gonna happen that way and I think it's again just a brilliant way to nerf this min-max metagaming that the audience does thinking super you should just reset right now it constantly evolves the formula and never gets stuck in one place for too long. I have a massive respect for the author Tape's willingness to refresh the formula on a regular basis. Yes, the return by death thing is still present and it happens, but it's thankfully not utilized too much. Instead, he pivots to my next favorite mm -hmm. aspect of ReZero, its world. God damn if I don't have a million questions. <laughs> And thankfully, at the same time, I trust him to deliver on them. Tape has a knack for intrigue that I rarely find elsewhere. He knows. Yeah. For one answer, we get like three separate questions. Knows how to guard his cards, and he doesn't reveal them too quickly. And the worst part, he's so troll. He doesn't reveal things, and quite often, he heavily sends you false positive signals to misdirect you on what's happening. Even right now, the whole thing with Al. It's screaming at us that Al could be Subaru from a different timeline. Yet, this could be another misdirection, right? Time after time, these mysteries just seem like Tape is trying to feed us with these hints. And he is. But sometimes, he completely just trolls you. And makes you think or assume some things based on the evidence being given. But actually, it's not that at all. And then boom, you're just astonished, mind blown. Fuck, he did it again. I've spent so much time speculating on why Subaru is there. Why and if the Witch of Envy brought him there. Her connection to Amelia, the witches, if they're really still the way. The Archbishops, how they gained their power. What are they after? What the Royal Selection really is. Mm -hmm. What's Pandora after? The Divine Dragon, the Cult, the Sword Saints, the Gates. There is so many questions. The magic system, the mechanics, it's all just constantly tickling my brain. The thirst for more bits of information keeps me hooked. And yep. if something is answered, Five more questions are created. Yep. I just love that trickle. And Tape is a genius at it. See the one really pulled off a nice gradual introduction to the world. The main I don't think it's random glaze or like, like, like when I when people say Tape is a genius, I actually believe it. Again, very rarely do I ever care for a story like this with this much depth. And the way that he's able to always keep us hooked in, engage with the story with so much mysteries. Again, the whole onion layer example, the more we watch, just the better it gets. Like, only a genius writer could have, you know, created an art like this. Main plot line of the Royal Selection. Subaru's circumstances for being there. Season 2 did a good job of diving deeper into the witches. And ultimately, the bigger threat within, Rosewall. But Season 3 really managed to kind of flip the table on me. As we are presented with at least four main key figures of the witches cult. While also banding together the main figureheads of the Royal Selection. It's five princesses versus four archbishops. That has me anxious to see how the dust settles. Why that is is because Tape is really good at kind of throwing in twists and turns. That keeps each encounter interesting. Which is mm -hmm. why I'm sure this battle royale is going to be an epic one. Shooting the first half of season three we got to see how reinhard who is like massively op and beating the crap out of sirius ends up being literally subaru's downfall his power ends up being what takes out subaru it's just so well crafted no scene no interaction is ever boring and that's not even to get into how amazing the presentation of this anime is sure yes they use cgi for crowds they use yeah it's really nice that tape has a close connection with the studio white fox that creates rezero and it just seems like they care a lot more than most studios that just make random shows. Is it for transportation here and there? And some very important segments are being skipped only for it to be covered in the chibi anime shorts. But overall, the series has been a pleasure to watch. Establishment shots absolutely pull you into the setting. Combat sequences are massive hype and well presented. Moments of tension are always accented by great lighting and tense perspective shots. Still to this day, Great lighting, yes, usually, but that goddamn, that wedding scene at the end, bro, so dark when Reinhardt and Subaru showed up. Day, the cast scroll on Subaru carrying Ram to the manor lingers in my mind. Talk yeah, in the 15. background, the snow picking up, the music playing, it's haunting yet so beautiful at the same time. Then, of course, there's the iconic chorus chants <laughs> that always cement the most shocking moments. The witch's call. To top it all off, as mentioned earlier, the character designs are all unique and fantastic. Every time a new character hits the scene, I'm immediately hooked. Sadly, yes, some of the recent ones are getting a peppering of censorship, but sadly, them's the breaks these days. All of this is to say that ReZero has easily cemented itself as one of my favorite franchises of all time. I yep. can't wait for each and every single episode. And the only fault that I can really find in the entire thing is, goddamn, bring back Rim. It's enough to make me extremely excited that one day I will dive into the novel series and I'll be sure to make a video series on it when it happens. All so right. Stick around. And that's pretty much it. 
We're just glazing rem right now. Sorry, re-zero right now. But I think it deserves to get, you know, glazed. And re-zero, cementing itself as one of the best isekais ever, is also one of the most hated shows of 2024. And when you have that much haters, you're probably doing something right. Did Top Air wrote, write Suicide Squad Isekai? Yes, he did. And can you come with your own conclusion on why that story is mid compared to ReZero and Vivi? Here's a hint. DC doesn't want its franchise from being altered. Why would Tape also give his best writing for a one-off show? It's a cheap fucking sponsored ad content. Tape went and gave them a mid-story because them over on DC, they also don't want volatility. They just wanted to do an anime slash, you know, DC collab and see how we would do. It makes a lot of sense to me why Suicide Squad was such a fucking mid-story. Anyway, that's it for me. Please go give Mr. Otaku Spirit a like on the video. Here's the link. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.